going to end the other meeting. Virtually once more. Uh, add an exclamation point onto what has already been a fantastic weekend of mathematics. Uh, it is now time to introduce our third plenary speaker for this year's meeting of the Rocky Mountain section of the MAA. We are honored and very fortunate to have with us today the editor of the College Mathematics Journal, Dr. Dominic Cleavy. Dr. Cleavy joins us today thanks to the MAA le editor lecture series. Uh, you'll see in your program bio that Dr. Cleavy has published works in journals which include Shakespeare Quarterly, as well as everyone's favorite gastrointestinal endoscopy. He has also published work on the topic of juggling sequences. Indeed, uh, I understand he is a, quite an accomplished juggler. And he is a master at engaging his students inside and outside the classroom. Uh, I was personally very intrigued to learn that his undergraduate students set a world record by finding the largest known weird number. If you're not wondering, a weird number is one whose proper divisors add up to more than the number, but no subset of its proper divisors adds up to exactly the number. Oh, and by the way, his students also broke that record by finding an even larger one. Uh, he has also had Math 101 students investigating correlation and regression in Mozart sonatas. And he developed a mathematics honors program at Central Washington University, where he is a professor of mathematics he is also a 2014 winner of the MAA's Alder Award, among many other accomplishments. Uh, maybe there's a bit of a theme to our section meeting because yesterday afternoon we had Jennifer Quinn's epic math battles, and today we have mathematical fights, the seedy underbelly of mathematical history. Rocky Mountain section, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dominic Cleavy. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my mute button kept disappearing on me. Uh, thank you for the generous introduction. I'm very impressed by the research that you clearly did. And thank you really, I know it's tradition, but it makes sense to thank the organizers for pulling off this great conference. They had to change modalities late in the game. Uh, and I've had a very great weekend so far. I am indeed following up on what Jenny did uh, in Jenny's talk different maybe approaches to math or to proof uh, within the battle. For me, it's the people themselves. And I want to talk about some of the things we know about mathematics. And I first actually want to take a step back and think about what people tell me about mathematics. Some people say that mathematics is logical. Uh, it's a great field because it always makes sense what we do. Maybe math is eternal. When you prove something, it's true forever. Uh, and maybe that gives us some sort of solace in the field that we have. Maybe math is perfect. The way that we do math is the best way that we could possibly do math. Uh, and I would like to tell you that my study of the history of mathematics has convinced me. Uh, can I can add one more. Maybe it's objective. Maybe personal feelings play no role in this. Uh, but my study of history tells me that none of these things are true. Uh, in fact, mathematics is considerably more human and considerably more messy then we're often led to believe. And I can't think of a better way to try to make this case than to present some of my favorite fights from the history of mathematics. Uh, all right, we're gonna start with at least one famous guy back several thousand years ago. And I want to present Euclid versus Nicomachus. Let's take whether two is a prime number. All right. Uh, Let's, I guess, back up and think about this. What is a prime number? Uh, if you ask this to somebody sort of in the hallway, the first answer you'll probably hear is this. A prime number is a positive integer divisible only by itself and one. Now, if that were the case, the primes would be one, two, three, five, seven, and they'd come forward from there. If you've taken or taught a number theory course recently, you'll probably be a little bit more careful here. And you might say this, uh, a prime number is a positive integer other than one divisible only by itself, and one. A uh, list of primes in this case would be the same, but one wouldn't be on the list. There's a third definition that maybe you haven't seen before. Uh, it goes like this. A prime number is a positive integer that cannot be evenly divided. 
If you can split it up evenly, it's not prime. And by this definition, two would not be on the list. The primes would start at three, five, seven, and count forward from here. All right, let's get to know our, our uh, battling people a little bit better. Uh, Euclid, perhaps a guy who needs more introduction. He's a Greek mathematician, but let's note he lived in Egypt. He was born, as far as we know, in Egypt and spent his time working there. So he would have looked like an Egyptian, not like a modern Greek person. Uh, he was the author, of course, of the famous Elements, this greatest geometry work in history. And he had a definition of prime number. Let's see what Euclid said. Euclid said, Protos, arithmos, esteno, monadai, muon, metromenos, which I think we can agree is a pretty good definition, but might need some unpacking. Uh, before we go on, quick note and reminder uh, to students or non-historically minded faculty, because we're mathematicians, we can read quite a bit of Greek. Let's see if we can break this down. Uh, this first letter is a capital pi. And whether or not you know Greek, I'll bet you can guess. What letter does, what sound does pi make in Greek? Well, and here's the part for those of you who like to sit in the front row will be glad that we're virtual. Pi says p. Uh, so we have a p sound here. The next letter is rho. So rho says er. There's an omega for o, and we can sound it out protos. Protos. Okay, maybe we're not quite sure what it means, but we can think of examples, a prototype, a protozoa as the first animal. It's some sort of uh, initial uh, or first something. Our next word is arithmos. And if arithmetic is being clever with arithmos, I guess arithmos is numbers. Now, we can't get through the whole thing this way, but it's nice to know we can pick out some words. Uh, this is often translated something like this. A prime number is that which is measured by the unit alone. You have a length six uh, line. You could measure it with the length two line by putting three of those together uh, and figuring out how long it was. If your number is prime, the only way to break it down into smaller pieces is using the unit that is a line of length one. All right, our second guy is Nicomachus, lived several hundred years after Euclid. Also, though the history books call him a Greek mathematician, he came from the modern day country of Jordan. He was a Pythagorean. And we should remember Pythagoras was alive five or six centuries before this, so his influence had lasted for a long time. He was a musician. He wrote this marvelous book called Introduction to Arithmetic, which is mystical and mathematical and describes properties of numbers, which ones are more feminine and masculine and powerful in all sorts of really intriguing ways. And he was the one that gave us our definition three earlier. A prime number is a number which cannot be evenly divided. For Nicomachus, two shouldn't count. Well, I like to think about whether it would matter if two didn't count, but first I want to back up a little bit and say, what about one? Uh, we had this sort of conflict in the first two definitions about whether one should count as a prime number, and if you have a number theory textbook on your shelf, it probably says one is not prime. It turns out this has not always been true. Uh, in the early 20th century, D.H. Lamer published the book uh, with a scintillating title. It was Factor Table for the first tens millions, ten millions, containing the smallest factor of every number, not divisible by two, three, five, or seven, between the limits of zero and ten million seventeen thousand. Which was exactly what it sounds like. Long lists of numbers on one column and the number's largest prime factor uh, on the next column. If you wanted to factor the number completely, you'd look up the prime factor, do a little manual division, find what the next number is, look that up and we uh, move on down through the list. And, you know, I kind of think he's on to something if he says one is prime. It is divisible only by itself and one. So why, why do we leave it off the list? And it turns out it's a very human decision. My favorite theorem, uh, I was trained as a number theorist and my favorite theorem has always been this. It's simple and yet it's so elegant. It says, Every positive integer can be uniquely written as the product of primes. Now, I know we know this is true, but uh, think about how wonderful this is. What does this mean? It means there are so many prime numbers that no matter which integer you pick, I can always find some primes to multiply together to get that integer. It also means there are so few prime numbers that no matter which integer you pick, you can never find more than one set to multiply together to get it. They're perfectly spaced among the set integers. Uh, 
it's a beautiful statement. As a number theorist, it makes me happy. What if one weren't prime? Well, we'd have to change it to something like every positive integer can be the product of primes. This expression is unique, except, you know, you could use one any number of times. 60 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5, but it's also 1 times 1 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. The theorem would be less beautiful, and that would make me sad. And for this reason, and almost this reason alone, uh, I and most other number theorists want not to count it. Let's go back to 2. What if Nick Marcus had won in 2 or not? prime number, uh, we'd have to change theorems to something like this. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a product of prime numbers and a power of 2. Ah, uh, right, because if 2 doesn't count as a prime, we're still going to need it in this factorization. It's okay, but it's not quite as nice. Uh, on the other hand, we would get this lovely statement. Once 2 is on the list, all primes are odd. And, well, if you think about it, since 2 is the only even prime, doesn't that make two rather odd? Uh, I, you're groaning, I hope. Uh, you muted computers. Uh, what if you had one? How many prime numbers would there be? And the answer, of course, is infinity minus one. In summary, Euclid versus Nicomagus. At stake, whether two is a prime number. Who cares? Well, 2,000 years of number theorists care. This is an important question. The winner was Euclid. His book sold far better, and two still counts as a prime today. All right, let's move on to our second story. Perhaps the most famous fight in all of mathematics, Isaac Newton versus Gottfried Leibniz. At stake is how to do calculus. Uh, you probably know something about this story, and I want to just hit the high points really, really quickly so we can move on to see what we get from the story. But here are the high points. 1666, Isaac Newton invents calculus, and this is a marvelous year, uh, at least in Newton's life. 1666, there was some amount of discussion in England that probably the world was about to end. Can you guess why? Uh, it's a scary looking number uh, for a Christian nation ending in 666. Not only that, 1666 was the seventh year after 1660. 1660, was when uh, Charles II was restored to the throne. So the Protestant reign of England had come to an end. God's people, uh, who had, were, had given like temporal control of the island, had been tossed off. And at least one reading of the book of Revelation suggests that seven years after God's people formed their kingdom, the world will end. Could it be a coincidence it ended in 1666? And then it got worse. The beginning of 1666, the Black Plague came to London. If you remember your hor four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, pestilence rode in as if to hail the year. And by the end of the year, the great fire of London had broken out and the city burned down. And I've seen stories of pastors standing in the streets as buildings cascade down them in flames, crying out, repent, the end of the world is today. And I think a rational person could be forgiven for believing it might be true. Uh, Isaac Newton wasn't there to see it burn down. Uh, once the Black Plague came to populated areas, everybody who could flee left. Yes, we're reminded of some of the stories we read two years ago. Uh, he went home from the family farm and with nothing to do, decided to spend his time trying to figure out what well, a lot of the things about the world he had long wanted to know. By the end of the year, uh, and it was a little more than maybe 18 months, by the end of the year-ish, he had invented integral and differential calculus, had formulated the laws of motion, had combined the laws of motions with calculus to explain the motion of more or less everything in the universe, had furthered the science of optics uh, dramatically, uh, seen some estimates that say it would have taken the rest of Europe a hundred years to do what he did, uh, and at the end of all of that, he went back to college and told nobody what he had done. You see, I think Newton had satisfied his own curiosity and he just didn't care about anybody else, uh, which meant that about 10 years after that, Leibniz had the chance to invent calculus. Uh, about 10 years after that, Leibniz published his calculus. About 20 years till later, Newton published his version of calculus and said, oh yeah, but really I did this way the heck back before Leibniz, so it should be me. At which point, their supporters started fighting. Uh, now, why do we care about this? And uh, 
It's a good question. And it's a question that I think has a nice historical answer. Let's look at people who advanced the theory of calculus. And I want to convince you this is not a list that I sort of put together to make a point. This is a list I stole from someone else. Doing this from my office I mean I can easily grab my props. So William Dunham, over a decade ago, published this book called The Calculus Gallery. There's one chapter each devoted to individuals, occasionally uh, families, who significantly advance the theory of calculus. So obviously, Newton and Leibniz make our list. So did the Bernoullis and Euler, Cauchy and Riemann, uh, on down the list of some fairly familiar names. And now I ask a probably not fair question. What do all of these people have in common? Or slightly more precisely, what do all these people who aren't Isaac Newton have in common? We can start asking what we know about some of these people. Uh, Leibniz was German. Do we know where the Bernoullis and Euler are from? And yes, uh, you likely do. They're Swiss. Cauchy is French. Riemann. Uh, even if we don't know, might guess he's German, and we would be right. Next, we have Leo V, who is also French, via Strasse, Cantor, Volterra, uh, whose name is fun to say, and must be Italian, and indeed he is, Baer and Lefebvre. Except for Isaac Newton, all of these people are from continental Europe. Now, the people from England do calculus during this time. Yes, but in a totally different set of like environment, different tools. Uh, they were almost incommensurate schools, if you sort of borrow from Thomas Kuhn, which meant they weren't looking at each other's work, which meant that most of the things that were done by people in England did not end up contributing to our modern history. This big break, this nationalistic break between two mathematical communities had significant impact in how quickly the theory evolved into its final form. So Newton versus Leibniz at stake, Credit for the invention of calculus, but also notation for all of time. Who cares? Well, I say everybody cares. I'll still tell our students this story. It's a big one. Winner, I think I'll follow what most modern books do and call this one a tie. All right, let's turn to something quite different. Fight three is Pope Gregory the Great versus the orbit of the Earth. At stake, the length of a year. What are we talking about here? Uh, our modern calendar, or, well, that's maybe not quite true. A modern calendar was created around the year 500 CE by Dion Dionysius Exeguus. Uh, he decided the church needed a new calendar. There were a couple ways of keeping track of years uh, that were in use at the time. They were both flawed, and most people knew they were flawed. He wanted a better one. and. To make a calendar, you need to decide two things. But whenever you make a scale that's going to measure anything numerically, we need two things. If you think of a temperature scale, what two things do you have to decide to come up with a temperature scale? We need a zero, so we have a starting place, and we need to know how big a degree is. And Fahrenheit and Celsius make two different decisions about both of those things. He needed to do something very similar. He needed to figure out where to put year one, and needed to figure out how long a year was. Well, where to put year one is a pretty easy question if you're a sixth century Christian. You start with the birth of Jesus. He got it wrong, uh, which is why we say now Jesus was born somewhere between 4 and 7 BC. Uh, but it's a reasonable, rational choice uh, coming from in the church. What about the length of a year? And we can ask, I guess, how long is a year, really? How long is a year in terms of days? We know a year is how long it takes the Earth to go all the way around the sun and come back to the same place. Uh, now, that question of how you know it comes back to the same place is kind of a tricky one. And it's worth thinking about, right? You can't like drop a rock and wait till you get back to the same place to see that it's there. But I want to set that side of question aside. Uh, it's an astronomy question, and the astronomers have answered it. How long is it? Well, you ask this question to a person quickly, and they'll probably answer 365 days, which is a really good first approximation. Uh, if we think a little more, we might say, you know, there's a leap year every, every day, every four years. So I guess that means we think our calendar needs an extra day every four years, which means it needs an extra fourth of a day every year. So maybe it's more precise to say 
365 days, six hours. And here we pause and I ask you of everything you know about the world and how it works. Do you think for the Earth to go around the sun, it spins 365 in exactly a quarter time? Like, does anything work that well and that nicely? And no, uh, we just know in our bones that can't possibly be how it is. Uh, more precise might be something like 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds. All right. Well, those last two numbers aren't really so far off. Uh, and Dionysius, when he made his calendar, uh, didn't know about the 48 minutes and 45 seconds. So he used the 365 and a quarter days. Uh, the Pope of the time liked it. The Pope was Gregory the Great, also called Gregory the First, and uh, trivia mm, suggestion in case you're ever caught in a game somewhere and someone asked you the question, which Pope? I will tell you Gregory is a really good answer because there have been a lot of Gregories. Gregory the First liked it and this became the official calendar of the church and therefore by default all of Europe uh, and by extension in the future, most of the Western world. And it's a pretty good calendar. The year is not exactly right, but it's only 11 minutes too long. And 11 minutes over the course of a year, we say maybe is good enough uh, to do what we need. But is it? Let's pursue this forward and see what happens. Uh, if the calendar is wrong by 11 minutes, I should say per year, uh, that also means it's wrong by a little over an hour in just six years. Well, 24 hours in the day and sort of round down for math. That means it's wrong by about a day every 228 years. And this counts up over time. Remember, the system was put in place around the year 600. Uh, so we count forward far enough. And by 1582, the calendar was wrong by 10 days. Uh, the seasons didn't match the calendar. Uh, but worst of all, if you're a 16th century Christian, what's the problem with a calendar that's wrong by 10 days? I'm gonna pause for a couple seconds in case someone guesses in the chat. Oh, it is, yes, we have several winners. Nice job, everybody. The date of Easter is wrong. Easter, that really tricky holiday. I mean, Christmas is easy. It's always the 25th of December. Thanksgiving isn't too bad, the fourth Thursday in November. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, which yes, is mouthful, but also depends on getting the equinox right. And it wasn't right. And this was a big problem for 16th century Christians. Uh, Easter is the day. It's the biggest holiday in the Christian year at the, at the risk of oversimplifying a lot of theology. Easter is why Christians aren't Jews, uh, and getting this day wrong is a big one, and so they needed to fix it. Uh, how do we fix the problem the calendar is wrong by 10 days? Well, there's kind of an easy solution. If you're 10 days behind where you should be, we could just skip ahead 10 days and set things to rights again. In 1582, the new pope decided to do exactly this. Uh, by the way, can you guess who was pope? in 1582. That's exactly right. Uh, they were up to Gregory the 13th at this point. Uh, the Gregory's just kept coming. He said this October, we're skipping 10 days. And then that year, uh, the calendar jumps straight from October 4th to October 15th. And can you imagine the problems this caused? Uh, things like, what if your birthday is skipped? Or do you owe a full month's rent in October? Your landlord still wants a full month's rent. Uh, he has the annual taxes coming due, but you probably get paid by the day down at the whatever they made in the 16th century uh, factory. Uh, this is kind of strange, uh, but it's even worse in terms of problems. You see, 1582 was about half a century after a really important event in European history. Can we guess what happened about 50 years earlier? that would have made this considerably more difficult. And I'm going to say yes, I hear somebody calling it out. Uh, this was about half a century after the Protestant Reformation, which meant if you were Swiss, if you were Swedish, uh, if you were British or from some parts of uh, Germany, and the Pope said, 
it's time to change your calendar to something else. Uh, people would have cried out collectively, no way. Uh, we're not going to follow these strange practices. We'll keep our own calendar. Thank you very much. Uh, as we resume traveling and come out of the pandemic, we have to keep thinking about time zones again. And uh, I don't know about you, but I always feel like they're a little tricky to deal with them most weeks, but it's still, is it forward? Is it back? Uh, which direction happens when they, they move this way? Time zones are hard. There were date zones in Europe, and there were date zones for hundreds of years. It was possible for a very long time to be in France on, say, the 4th of July, to say it set on a boat to cross the English Channel, and to land on June 25th. A uh, remarkably confusing set of things. And it got even worse uh, because if you're not Catholic, there's no single source that can tell everybody how to change. And it happened very slowly uh, and very messily in the Europe, in the world for a long time. Uh, Britain changed in 1752, which meant so did the United States change in 1752. Uh, we still have records. You can go back to the newspapers of the time which people wrote in to complain about uh, this, this strange calendar, how, how bad it would be. Ben Franklin was actually publishing the Poor Richard's Almanac at this time. He penned this lovely little essay, which included something like, the calendar change should cause no concerns, especially for the more lazy among us. For how nice shall it be to go to bed on the 2nd of September and not have to wake until the 14th? Uh, also fun fact, when this change happens, everybody's birthday changes. Which if we think about it, maybe kind of makes sense. Uh, your birthday should probably be 365 days after your last birthday, because when a full year has passed. So if you skip 10 or 11 days from the calendar, you're gonna have to push your birthday farther back. And uh, this is the reason why when you look people up from this time period, you'll often find two different birthdays. You'll find two different birthdays listed for George Washington. Uh, Isaac Newton is a great example. Look him up in your favorite encyclopedia, and it will tell you he was born on January 4th. Had you asked him during his lifetime, Sir Isaac, when were you born? He would have truthfully answered on Christmas Day. The Christmas Day becomes January 4th, and you correct for the calendar change. Uh, a big mess, uh, Sweden, uh, here's a Swedish calendar. Sweden has decided that skipping 10 days all at once was way too difficult. So they would just drop leap years. They would drop leap years starting in 1704, and then that means in 1704, they would get one day closer to where they wanted to be. And then four years later, they could get another day closer they wanted to be. Uh, it worked pretty well for a little while, but in 1712, they were too busy fighting the Great Northern War against Russia to remember to drop leap year, at which point they gave up, ran a 30-day February, which is a calendar you see here, to reset to the old calendar, which it kept for about 50 years, and then finally jumped forward with everybody else. Russia didn't switch until the fall of the Tsar in 1917, Greece till 1922. It turns out the fact that we live in a world where we agree on the date is a startlingly modern phenomenon. And it's all due to the fact that sometimes being imprecise can make a really big difference. All right, Gregory versus the Earth's orbit. In summary, let's take the length of a year. Who cares? Well, anybody using a calendar cares about this. The winner in this case was math. All right, I want to tell one more story about my favorite mathematician, Leonard Euler, and his colleague and once friend, Jean Laron d'Alembert. They worked together, they collaborated, they seemed to get on quite, quite well for some time until their friendship was torn apart because they could not agree on the pivotal question of the natural logarithm of negative one. All right, some background. Euler, we all know, was a brilliant mathematician and physicist. I'll tell you, he was also a really humble guy. Uh, he was kind and generous. Uh, he was generous with priority. We have many examples when he was, say, being the editor of a journal, or someone would send in a result, and it was a result that he himself had proven already, uh, instead of writing back and letting them know, especially if he hadn't published his result. Uh, he would just publish their result and let them get the credit for it. And this happened repeatedly, and it's very cool, I think. D'Alembert is primarily a philosopher. A uh, mathematician is really a second calling to him. He was one of the people together with Diderot who put together the French Encyclopédie. This is the 18th century French attempt to compile all of human knowledge in a systematic way. It's very much uh, 
18th century French Wikipedia. Uh, so he knew a lot. He was well versed. He wasn't really a mathematician, but he liked to dabble. Uh, he was also desperate for recognition. His greatest goal in life was that if he walked into the room, everybody would turn and say, oh, there's the brilliant D'Alembert. He saw this every place that he went. They wrote letters to each other, and happily, most of those letters survived so we can read their mail. Uh, the first two letters, I think we do have, if I remember correctly, but weren't important for this subject. So here's the third of their letters that survives. Euler wrote, and uh, I'll read this and then give you some context. He said, you must permit me to be in disagreement with your feelings on the subject of the log of negative x, which you believe not to be an imaginary number. I believe it is imaginary and is equal to pi times the quantity one plus or minus two n times the square root of negative one, where pi indicates the circumference of a circle of diameter one and n is any number whatsoever. All right, what's going on here is D'Alembert has submitted a paper to a journal where Euler worked. Euler was the editor of the, the journal. Uh, Euler read the paper and liked quite a bit of it, but didn't like what D'Alembert wrote about the log of negative x. And he wrote to let him know that he thought D'Alembert had it wrong. Uh, also really striking, I think, in this is that Euler has to explain what pi is, right? Pi indicates the circumference of a circle of diameter equal to one. Pi at this time, it had been used before Euler, but some people meant it to be this number that's about 3.14. Some people meant it to be what's often now called tau, the number about 6.28. And it was so non-standard, uh, you had to specify which one you meant. We also have a nice chance here, I think, to think about something. Uh, I don't know how many students are left in the conference, but if you're here, let me encourage you. If you take any math or science class and someone uses a Greek letter, to raise your hand and say, why that Greek letter? Uh, of all the symbols we could have chosen, why this one? And we can ask this for pi. Uh, the number is so important, we definitely need a name for it. But why should we call it what we do? I'm going to import a sort of cheap vertical whiteboard here. Uh, pi is well chosen. It turns out pi is the first letter in this word. And uh, now that we're getting good, I don't quite know that's happening. Now that we're getting good at our Greek, we can try to sound it out. Pa, a, er, e, m, e, t, e, er. It's the first letter in perimeter. You'll often see it's the first letter in periphery, which it also is, uh, but it stands for exactly what it should. So very cool. Uh, or those signals that the log of negative numbers might not be as simple as D'Alembert believed. Well, D'Alembert wrote back and said, with regard to the log of negative x, everything you tell me disturbs me a great deal. I would appreciate it if you would cross that part out of my treatise, uh, that portion where it's discussed, if it has not already gone to the printer. But the guy doesn't give in easily. He sort of trusts Euler as a superior mathematician, but he also doesn't want to believe that he's wrong. So immediately after this, he gives an argument involving hyperbolas about why the law of negative numbers is what he says it is. Our next letter is also from D'Alembert. And if you're sufficiently eagle-eyed, you notice the dates of the two of these. Letter five, January 29th. Letter six, later that day, you can just tell it was like bothering him all day that he maybe admitted that he could be wrong. So now he writes this angry letter that follows up with the first one. He says, okay, Euler, according to you, we find, uh, we need to find a function of y, which in making y negative does not change its value, except that it gives birth all of a sudden to an imaginary constant. Well, he concluded in the least convincing mathematical argument of all time, I declare that I am unable to conceive of such a function. Uh, that can't be how the log of negative numbers worked. And then he gave another argument for what's going on. Uh, how do we find the log of a negative number? And let me show you what this might look like. It's a pretty simple argument. Dalembert said the log of negative one is certainly equal to the log of one divided by negative one. We all good with this so far? Now we're assuming here we don't yet know how negative logs work. But I'll bet we can agree that we really want to keep the laws of logarithms so they hold, even in the context of negative numbers. And if they do, this is equal to the log of 1 minus the log of negative 1. All right, well, connect the inequalities. Set the first one to the last one. And we can add the log of negative 1 to both sides. 
This means that 2 times the log of negative 1 is equal to the log of 1, which in turn is equal to 0, which means the natural log of negative 1 must be 0. Uh, is it? Well, we probably know the answer to this. Uh, we know you have a favorite equation. I'll bet some of you do, and I'll bet for many of you it's e to the pi i equals negative 1. Uh, it's, it's a lovely piece of math. Well, if e to the pi i is negative 1, you take the natural log of both sides. That means pi times i is the log of negative 1. And now we're rapidly thrown into a bit of cognitive dissonance here. Uh, is the log of negative 1 pi times i, or is the log of negative 1 0? Is Dahlen Bear right, or is Euler right? And uh, if you haven't figured out the way out of this, I encourage you to think about it. So it's a really fun problem to work on. Uh, but he gives this argument right away. Uh, Euler kind of ignored the argument. Uh, he really didn't want to get sucked into this with Dahlen Bear. Dahlen Bear would not let go. Uh, so he wrote again, I think you're wrong, here's why. He wrote again, I think you're wrong, here's why. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Euler finally wrote back, said, I, I've learned from our, you know, shared friend, Monsieur de Maupertuis, that you wish to suspend your work in mathematics in order to reestablish your health. I approve so heartily of this resolution. Uh, that was not enough, sort of a gentle reminder. Uh, but the 17th letter, Euler wrote back and said, the matter of imaginary logarithms is no longer so familiar to me that I may rigorously respond to your latest remarks, which was 100% not true. Uh, Euler had not forgotten how the logs and negative numbers and imaginary numbers worked. Euler didn't forget anything. Uh, he's sort of famous for some of these, these things. There's, there's a story from late in his life where someone could say, Professor Euler, did you read the Aeneid when you were a boy? He'd say, oh, yes, I very much liked the Aeneid. Uh, it was a great work. He could say, do you remember page 173 of the Aeneid? Euler would say, ah, oh, yes, it began. And he would start reciting in Latin. Uh, he could hold this whole thing in his head. This is also why he was so productive, famously after he went blind. Uh, so he could just do pages and pages of math, hold all the things there. He hadn't forgotten this. He just didn't want to reply to Dallin Bear and argue. And this made Dallin Bear more and more angry until he felt personally insulted, leading to a break. Euler was working at the time for the Berlin, Berlin Academy of Sciences, and Dallin Bear wrote to the Academy to protest four things. He said, there's four things that Euler says he discovered. It's the procession of the equinoxes. This one's kind of cool, actually. We know that the Earth's axis doesn't point straight up and down in the plane of the solar system. It's tilted at like 23 degrees, right? Which is why it points to the North Star. Uh, that's why we get seasons. Uh, it turns out that that point direction is not always the same. That the direction the Earth's axis is pointing slowly spinning over like 27,000 years. So our North Star will not be our North Star forever. Uh, Euler had written about that. D'Alembert said, no, 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 that was me who came up with that first. There were cuspidal points of the second kind, which is a sort of tricky to explain issue in 18th century algebra about whether a continuous function can have sort of a bird's beak shaped uh, singularity. Uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra, that every degree and polynomial has n roots as long as you count them right, Alan Bear said that he had proven, uh, and of course, the natural log of negative one. All those should go to him, he said. Euler actually gave in on the first two, though he probably shouldn't have. Uh, it's pretty clear Euler's work was better. But for number three and four, Dahlen Bear was simply wrong, and Euler was not about to let the mathematics stand. Uh, this eventually broke their friendship and led to decades of intellectual sniping. And uh, it's kind of fun to see this. There's something that Euler wrote an article, Euler wrote for the Journal Encyclopédie. So once they tried to finish the French Wikipedia, there were follow-up updates uh, and reports that came out, and this was something Euler put here. Uh, here, down here, we have remarks of Euler, and it's probably hard to see on this computer. So let me show you a trick I learned from Star Trek. Computer, magnify. Uh, which is only the second coolest trick, because we can do this one next. Computer, enhance. There, isn't that great? Uh, <clears throat> remarks of Mr. Euler uh, concerning the publication of Alambert's Opus Cool Mathematique, so his little mathematical works. And Euler writes, all the journals or all the newspapers that have announced the third volume of D'Alembert's Opus Cool Mathematique have remarked that I refuted him on many points. And this illustrious author himself uh, points this out in the preface. And I'm already so accustomed to these criticisms 
And this Dom here has attacked me on several points, and I'm still convinced he's wrong, and sort of goes off for quite a long time before swinging back into the science. Uh, the two of them seem to have hated each other uh, in ways that leaked into their professional work in a method we don't often see these days. Not only that, the only unprofessional, or uh, sorry, unethical act that we know from Order's life, and I'm sure he was not perfect in the rest of his life, but again, uh, he seems to have been very above board. Uh, but D'Alembert submitted some mathematical work uh, to a journal. Euler himself had proven that result, but he proved it after D'Alembert. Euler took his paper, put it in a backdated issue of the journal that hadn't yet been published, and made it look like he got priority. Uh, he stole that one, and shame on you, Leonard, for breaking an otherwise remarkable streak. All right, Euler versus D'Alembert. What's at stake? Well, some logs of negative numbers. Who cares? Well, all European mathematicians at the time cared, and the computer uh, future of complex analysis would depend on getting it right. The winner, I'm happy to say, was the person who should have been the winner, Leonard Euler. What do we take away from thinking about some of these fights? Well, we're reminded, as we think through history, that some parts of mathematics really are a human construct. Uh, I believe the fact that there are infinitely many prime numbers is woven into the fabric of the universe, but whether two counts is a choice we get to make. Seeking glory does nothing to advance mathematics. And good mathematical arguments will win out in our messy world, though it will sometimes take a long time. Mathematicians, in ways that aren't always obvious in the sidebars of the history sections of our calculus books, are illogical, emotional, and are fully human creatures. They are able to do mathematics, uh, which gives us, the rest of us, hope and a reminder that we can do the same. And with this happy thought, I stop. And thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dominic. I think uh, may possibly have time for some questions. Um, Questions are harder than usual in virtual environment. Well, I I really appreciated the uh, the uh, note at the end uh, that um, <clears throat> even those of us who are imperfect uh, can uh, contribute to and continue to do mathematics. Let's see, uh, Dave says, "Do you work any of this into your teaching?" Uh, that's a great question. Um, the does one count as prime and does two count as prime uh, will come up in almost all of my classes. This is my very favorite example of the difference between sort of math that's a human decision and math that's forced upon us by the logic of the universe. I don't, at least from my background, that wasn't like usually emphasized. Uh, the fact that you could count two as being not prime or you could count one as being prime and universe would still be fine uh feels viscerally weird to me at first uh so i love the example uh the length of the year comes up in almost all of my cats classes how much precision do we need and the answer is it really depends on the context and sometimes being a little wrong is too wrong i have to add i see the value in counting two as not prime because pretty much everything that deals with prime numbers gets stuck with two. And you have to have a totally different argument. And some of the biggest conjectures were stuck at two. So if we don't call it prime, we solve the problem with, you know, one, uh, one yeah. decision. Super true. There are a lot of theorems in number theory that say all primes except for two dot dot dot. And I'll also say this, 
it was such a well-rounded talk. It's not that we don't have questions. It's that you actually answer them as we are going through it. So. There's one question you might still have, uh, which is the most common question that I get, which is, uh, isn't the calendar breaking again? I think it's going to break in like 20,000 years or something like that with the latest numbers. Am I wrong? Uh, no, that's absolutely right. Uh, we might be worried that it's going to be wrong every 11 minutes wrong every year. So we're counting up again. Uh, and this is a chance for us to remember that almost everything we were taught in school was actually a lie when you look closely at it. So we were taught there's a leap year every four years. So we should expect that might not be true. And indeed, it's not. Uh, there's a leap year in our system every four years, except for century oh. years. Oh, which is also a lie. Uh, it's a leap year every four years, except for century years, unless that century is also multiple of 400, in which case we're good. Uh, the leap year is back on. And Mona's right. This will keep us steady till about the year 20,000. And there's some discussion in the calendrical community about what to do with the year 20,000. So if you want to get involved, it's not too late to make your voice heard. The one thing that I go back again and again, and I'm sorry for talking too much, I'll stop, is how impressively good people were at math so many thousands of years ago. Because this, how many leap years to add and all the calendar, this is not an easy problem. It's, you need to do a lot of computations and they didn't even have paper when they made those decisions. Right. <laughs> I'm always impressed by how complicated math people used to do very long time ago. My anthropologist friend who works in the period from like 10 to 14,000 years before present keeps reminding us that they were really, really smart people even really, really long ago. Right. Well, um, uh, thank you once more uh, uh, to Clevy. Um, I will uh, um, say also, uh, I think the, this, uh, I will also say uh, thank you once more also to the organizers of this conference, the Faculty of Metropolitan State University, Denver, um, uh, especially uh, uh, Mona and John uh, for your, all your hard work in managing all the many details in bringing us here together. Thank uh, you. And, I'm sorry? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you also to our partner, Fox Publishing, for their hard work and patience with us uh, and for their expertise with the virtual side of things. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers, um, including our three fantastic plenary speakers, Dr. Jennifer Quinn, Dr. Jose Perea, and Dr. Dominic Clevey. And to everyone who gave or attended a talk, thank you very much. Um, as a reminder, I would like to once more invite you all to consider some ways that you could be involved with the Rocky Mountain section. Um, nominate a colleague for the Early Career Teaching Award or the Burton W. Jones Distinguished Teaching Award. Uh, apply for a section activity grant. Uh, consider host, uh, serving on a section committee and please do consider hosting a future meeting at your campus. Uh, on that topic, I look forward to seeing you all next year, April 21st and 22nd at Black Hills State University in Spearfish, South Dakota. That is my home institution. And I know that we are really looking forward to hosting you guys. Uh, I know that all of us are excited at the prospect, I will say prospect of finally, hopefully seeing each other in person once more. Um, and finally, this is the closing comments section, but the conference is actually not over. There is one more session uh, with Dr. Molly Moran of Colorado College. Dr. Moran was our early career teaching award winner from I think 2020. Um, so I invite you to head on over to that. The uh, talk begins at two o'clock uh, mountain time. And the title is using abstract art in the transition to abstraction in mathematics.